Well, thanks for joining everybody. Um, we have a special speaker tonight, and his name is Jerry Steinauer, and he has spent a majority of his career as the botanist slash plant ecologist with the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission. He grew up in Millard, Nebraska. He grew up in Millard, Nebraska, when it was still a small town on the fringe of Omaha. He attended Wayne State College and the University of South Dakota. So please join me in welcoming Jerry for his talk on prairie restoration. And so now he'll give a background on himself and get started. Well, that's that's about my whole background right there. Um, I've worked for Game and Parks for G since 1989. And about 20 years ago, I put in a a grant to the Environmental Trust to do prairie restorations through the Prairie Plains Resource Institute that are here in Aurora on Game and Parks lands. And it was a three-year grant. And I kind of decided that, uh, well, I was kind of tired of living in Lincoln and working in that big office building and that we had money for some staff that I'd go out and take that position that we needed to hire. Well, my supervisor said, well, we'll work out something. So they said, you go to Aurora, work half time doing these prairie restorations for the three years of the grant. And then do your other duties half time and then just come back to Lincoln and do your old job. So I came to Aurora, worked on prairie restorations for three years and then they never, I went back to my old duties and they never said anything about moving back to Lincoln. So I just stayed out here. So most of what I learned about prairie restoration is working with the Prairie Plains Resource Institute for those three years. And I'll talk about those, that group during the slideshow, probably taking a little over a half hour. I like to keep my talks kind of informal. So just, if you have a question or a comment, just throw it out right during the talk, please. I don't mind being interrupted. Um, this is a restoration I saw a couple years ago, a beautiful lowland prairie restoration, which are really hard to do at the University of Wisconsin. And, you know, they've been doing restorations farther east of us in states for a, a lot longer time than Nebraska has, you know, some just beautiful restorations. And do, 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 why isn't it moving? Interesting. I did. Um, <laughs> all right, hold on. Uh oh. Well, sorry about this. Okay, there's some, among prairie restorationists, now they say the new term should be prairie reconstruction, but I'm an old timer, so I'm staying with restoration. So this is generally when you seed prairie seed into an area that's not prairie. Most of the, what we do is cropland, but we'll um, reseed into brome fields or somebody's backyard, you can do a little prairie restoration. Interseeding is when we enhance a pretty degraded prairie that has low species diversity by putting seed into this established prairie um, species that are missing. Um, why do prairie restoration? Well, it's a pretty simple answer, you know, Eastern Nebraska, we've lost around 99% of our tall grass prairie uh, has gone to farming. Um, other prairie types, less decline, mixed grass prairie, you know, maybe 40 or 50% is left in central Nebraska. And to be honest, we have very few really high quality remnants left. Most have been degraded by overgrazing, use of herbicides, exotic plants. This is just showing a landscape on the Central Platte River. The red is crop ground. The blue is where grasslands exist, not that all of those 
our native grasslands. So there's been a lot of loss and degradation of our prairie. So people are trying to put some of this back on the ground. And you know, the thing about you go into cropland, you know, I just had this discussion with the wetlands class this morning, you know, how much of the prairie are we receding? We're putting the plants back, but over most of eastern Nebraska, we've lost all the topsoil to soil erosion, two to three feet of topsoil in most places. And most of the prairie's biodiversity is actually below ground in that organic rich topsoil. And you can't replace that. You know, that takes thousands of years to develop. So we can put the plants back, but in a lot of places, we're still missing that original prairie soil. So why do restorations? Well, we can create a lot of habitat for prairie plants, uh, animals. Uh, we can use local ecotype native seed from local prairies close to the restoration and serve, preserve those local genetics of those species by putting them in restorations. Um, you know, the big thing now is pollinator habitat, and we're actually getting a fair number of the funds we do as a game in parks and other with other conservation agencies through pollinator grants. It's a, uh, it's the buzzword that you have to use to get a lot of grants to do prairie restoration and it helps with other habitat work also. Um, you know, and this is some work Chris Helzer is doing on the Central Platte on the Nature Conservancy's Platte River Preserves. The green is where native prairie remnants are, and the red are his prairie restorations. And he's looking a lot of this as reconnecting the prairie landscapes, giving, you know, maybe there's plant species in this remnant, giving them a corridor, corridor, corridor to migrate or insects. So kind of unfragmenting the landscape um, enlarging native prairies through putting restorations by them. You know, uh, ecosystems are where to, you know, we're put grass prairie on the landscape, you're helping prevent future soil erosion. Uh, a lot of programs in some of the big ag states of putting prairie back on the ground. Iowa has a big program of using prairie strips to pre, you know, improve water quality, soil erosion, stream buffers. And there's talk you know, about climate change of using prairie restoration to get carbon out of the air stored in the soil. And we're a little hopeful with um, a new administration that maybe there'll be funds coming um, I read some of Biden's stuff and, you know, he's looking at uh, trying to store carbon through grass plantings as uh, one of his climate change efforts. So maybe we'll get some money to do some prairie restorations. Um, a little bit about history of prairie restorations. You know, the Midwest, you, know, you think of Wisconsin, the Chicago area, that's kind of, we're kind of the classic ecologists as far as prairie restoration where they begin their work. Um, Ray Schulenberg uh, from Illinois was a big timer. He actually came from Nebraska, but Nebraska had one of the first prairie restorations at Homestead National Monument in 1939. They planted some areas with seed, but they also did a sod transplant from a uh, nearby prairie that was gonna be plowed up. And you can go back to that area today where they put the sod in, cut pieces of sod and hauled them by a truck. And it's got species, some of the more conservative prairie species are just still in that spot where they put the sod and you know they didn't come in the rest of the res restoration. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, when I lived in Lincoln, there was a prairie down by Highway 77 that was going to be plowed up. So for two summers, I hauled sod in the back of my Mazda 232 and started this probably a 15 by foot 20, 15 by 20 foot prairie in my own backyard with real prairie sod. Then I decided 
to move, sold the house, and I think that prairie soon disappeared. 1950s through 70, we had the soil bank program that put a lot of grassland in the Midwest back to grass, but it was not high diversity prairie. But what we do find, you find these prairie remnants mainly in Southeast Nebraska, these reseedings where there's some species, Kansas species that you see in these restorations like Rattlesnake Master and the purple indigo that I think what happened is they went out to some meadows in Kansas and combine harvested the seed and used them in these grass plantings in Nebraska and these species got in that way. It's, it's kind of the only way to explain, but they, we, some of those are some pretty neat looking prairie restorations. And I think it was kind of an accident through, they just harvested native seed for those. But um, the big push in Nebraska restoration came by the Prairie Plains Resource Institute, a little nonprofit group started by Bill and Jan Whitney in uh, central Nebraska and Bill just started doing prairie restorations. That's what he wanted to do, kind of was self-funded. Um, and he started right outside of Aurora, this city. He gave him a couple acres of land and he did like a three acre prairie restoration, which is still outside of Aurora here, about three blocks from my house. This is a uh, Bill hand collected seed and uh, he even hand collected the grass seed for his first little restorations. And then he made this great contraption out of a riding lawnmower and this early seed stripper. <laughs> and basically there's a, it spins these blades, knocks the grass heads off and funnels them down to a bin. It probably wasn't very efficient to the equipment he had. But back in those days, you know, Bill, when I was came to Aurora, you know, he was doing some 20 and 30 acre prairie restorations. And those, he collected all the seed by hand, used his machine, but he hand planted it all also. These characters are some of his early seeding crew. Um, you may think hand planting is, is slow, but uh, the Weiss family farm in South Dakota, I, I did 10 acres of hand seeding one winter and it took me about three or four hours. So it, it can go rather fast, um, but there's faster methods today. So Prairie Plains really, that's who I learned prairie restoration from and uh, Fish and Wildlife, the Nature Conservancy, they all learned it from Bill also. So we use local ecotype seed uh, versus cultivar seed. And what local ecotype is, as I kind of mentioned, it's seed collected from nearby prairies or from restorations that were planted with local ecotype seed. So you have the genetics that are adapted to your area. You know, we may go 100 miles, maybe a little farther. Cultivar seed, which is sold by a lot of seed dealers, um, cultivar grasses have been bred up for either high seed production, um, quick establishment, uh, extensive growth for livestock production. I always can, you know, they have uh, basically a genetically, they're all pretty similar plants. Um, bred up for certain purposes, developed over years by selective breeding. They have some cultivar wildflowers. Um, just to give you a little demonstration why local ecotype seed, uh, Kansa Prairie in Kansas, tall grass prairie on limestone, there's a, K State has a big research area. They did this study, they looked at the genetics a big blue stem, the dominant grass. And then they put a big plot, not big plot. Then they put a rain shelter on it that for a couple of years, it, it was sat about 10 feet high. It reflected, deflected most of the rainfall on making a droughty condition. They ran genetics and found that the whole plant, a whole different 
genotype, a big blue stem, took over that plot, a drought resistant that had drought resistant genes. That seed or that plant was probably in that plot, but in a few years, it changed dominance. That different, I'll call it a genotype, took over. So those genes were present to withstand drought in that local population of big blue stem, which I think is pretty fascinating. This is just our seed mix at the end of the year. No questions yet? All right, I will continue. Um, so why use it? I kind of talked about this. Preserve local genetics. Another interesting thing they are finding is that a lot of insect species, um, there's a bee that pollinates and gets its food source only from Monarda, or a, no, a pitcher sage, a native prairie plant. It's the only thing that bee species lives on. Its life cycle of that insect has to be tied to when that plant flowers. If you bring in a genetic variety of that plant from say Tennessee, it may have a different flowering period and it may not be timed to the uh, emergence period of that bee. So I think there are so many insect species that feed on one species of prairie plant. Um, I could go on about that, but so we think our local ecotype will be better timed to the insects that require those plants. And I mentioned this, but you know, if you have a really um, aggressive type of grass, that's a cultivar, it's, you know, less chances, there's more chances it's gonna be very aggressive and outcompete your wildflowers that you want to put in there also. We harvest from native prairies, you know, other restorations. A lot of times, you know a prairie was there because these prairie plants are in the road ditches yet, but next to it is crop field. So these prairie plants survived in the road ditches after the um, prairie was destroyed. So prairie plains will do a fair amount of collection from roadsides. Um, some groups, there's a lot of restorationists farther east that grow seed in production plots. They'll harvest local ecotype seed and then grow them in these, and some of these plots are pretty big, an acre or two. Very, a lot of work for watering and weeding, but you can get a pretty good seed harvest. This is John Judson, a prairie restorationist from uh, Northeast Iowa that he's a sharp character. I've heard a lot from talking with John. He really knows his stuff about prairie restoration also. Um, you know, Prairie Plains puts in about and a lot of their mix is 100 species of plants in a planting, um, from the dominant grasses to sedge. This is Brever sedge, uh, purple prairie clover, bush clover. Um, not to say all those come up in a planting. Um, some species, like this little delphinium, it is so tough to get much seed from it when you're harvesting from prairies, uh, the capsules ripen quickly and drop their seed pretty quick and just to be there at the right time is pretty tough and you get a minuscule amount of seed so I, we do have a problem of getting enough seeds from some species to make them really show up in restorations um i about this too you know and forage value, you know, if if I was a rancher, which I'm not, but, you know, a lot of people plant fields of smooth brome. Smooth brome is an exotic cool season. It's got peak growth in the spring, kind of goes dormant in the summer. You know, if you plant a high diversity of grasses and sedges, you know, you have cool season, you have things that start growing in the spring for forage, you have a lot of warm season grasses that come on strong in the summer. There are some range people that think, you know, you put these wildflowers in, they have pretty deep root systems that 
those species might be bringing up some micronutrients from the subsoil that might be pretty important for livestock health. Um, not a ton of research on that idea, but um, um, I just think a lot of forage species would be good for livestock. This is a, uh, on the right, you can see my pointer. Yes. This is on a Nature Conservancy property in the Platte Valley where they excavated a shallow wetland down to groundwater and collected wetland seed and actually restore. We actually do some wetland restorations too. Um, looks like Alisma, um, soft stem bulrush, some other things growing in this wetland. Do, do, do. Okay, the, getting into the process, there's seed collecting and process and storage, site preparation and planting and post planting management. Um, you know, the dominant prairie grass is like Indian, Indian grass, big blue, um, side oats, switchgrass. They're actually about 90% of the biomass of a tall grass prairie. Um, so we put on about two pounds of their seed per acre. And the best way, you need a lot of grass seed, in other words, is to combine harvest. So this is a normal combine for crops. This is an old one here that you have to do some adjustments to the fans and all that, but you can go out and harvest a lot of grass in a field in a pretty short time. This, the Fish and Wildlife Service in Kearney has what's called a rice head. This is for harvesting rice and it has these little rubber teeth. And they found out it's great for harvesting prairie seed. Much more efficient than a normal combine with a corn or soybean head. The, this spins around and the grass gets caught in those rubber teeth and it's much more efficient at not losing grass seed. Some years are really good for grass seed or any prairie seed, and it's not always the wettest years, actually really wet years. The seed production is pretty low on a lot of your tall grasses. Um, the best is moderate rainfall, believe it or not. And if you would burn a prairie in spring, it really promotes seed production. So we try to burn prairies where we're gonna harvest grass to get a lot of grass seed production. Um, Jason here is using a pull behind stripper. So basically this has a wire brush in here. It's spinning and it throws the seed into a bin behind there. You can get, oh, 60 to 90 gallons of seed in that bin. Pull it with a four wheeler, a lot less complicated from a combine, but you can't get enough. Um, the Nature Conservancy actually had a guy put a little like rice head in one of these. Cost a few more thousand dollars. But this has a, it's kind of neat. It's got a hydraulic system where you can raise it if you get to a patch of taller seed. You know, they're just harvesting general prairie seed here. You know, if you come to a patch of smooth brome and exotic grass, you stop harvesting. So it's, these machines have got a lot fancier over the last few years. Um, so when you harvest all this grass seed, you know, you use a combine, you get barrels and barrels of seed in a day. And the reason I have this is in the old days, we used to put tarps out. We had a little place in Aurora and we'd spread all this seed on these huge tarps outside and turn them with a grain shovel every day or two so they wouldn't get moldy. And if it rained, boy, we were over there covering, or covering them. But we came up with a better method. I didn't do it, but this is an old uh, grain bin and there's grain fans, big grain fans. And we run a perforated tube into this box and you can fill this big box with a load of grass seed and those grain fans dry it overnight. And now what Prairie Plains, they've actually built a wood one that they have on the back of a trailer and they haul it out to where they're harvesting and run the, run the fan right there. 
and um, dry the seed. Um, so that it's one thing you have to be careful about is that you once you pick the seed, you have to get it dry pretty fast or to start molding and go bad. So hand collecting a lot of the wildflowers and wetland plants here out there picking by hand. This is I oh an old intern years ago. She's picking burr reed, a wetland plant heads right there. So then you come back to the shop and you've got to dry the seed. So we put it in garbage can lids or there's tarp spread out. And this is an indoor shop where it's drying. I can't tell you what these species are from here. But um, another process, a lot of things like the rose seed is in a hip, sunflower seeds are in a head. You, you've got to break that seed out because you don't want to be throwing the whole rose hip in one area of your restoration. You want to get that seed separated. So there's a process um, called hammer milling. And back in the old days, this was a high school kid in Aurora made this first in his high school shop class. Has a lawnmower fan in there. Um, there's the fan. It sucks the seed and it runs it through this fan and then into this bin. And it's a pretty powerful pull. I was trying to unplug a clog once. I was ramming a shovel handle in there and it just sucked that shovel handle right out of my hand and made a pretty loud noise. But here is a prairie rose. This is the unprocessed seed compared to the processed seed. Um, you know, sometimes we would clean that seed, run it through screens, but most of the plantings we do, we aren't worried about really precise weights or amounts. But, you know, the commercial restoration outfits, they will tell you that you have two ounces of this seed or that seed in your seed mix. And they really clean their seed really fine, run it through fine hammer mills. They get all the kind of trash grass, all the non-seed stuff out of there. So it's just pure seed. And when they sell it like that, they have to get it tested for viability. So they need really clean seed. And they go through a lot of work cleaning their seed where we really don't do it. And I'll tell you why here in a second. Um, this is kind of a cool thing that Prairie Plains, you know, milkweeds have been really big. So they've been collecting tons of milkweed. I mean, like 20 barrels of milkweed pods. And they were trying to break the seed out of their pods. And we would have milkweed cleaning get togethers where we'd sit around with a couple barrels and crack the pods open and pull, push the seeds out by hand. And that took a lot of time. They did a little modification of their combine and they, they just started dumping those <laughs> barrels of milkweed pods and running it through their combine. And it actually worked pretty good. And it was kicking all the fluff out of the milkweed fluff out of the back is what's going on there. Um, so this is a uh, harvest of prairie plain seed for a summer, wildflower seed, all different seeds in buckets. You know, you, you got to cool it in a fairly dry, cool place. Um, if you have it in a really hot place, you know, it's going to lose viability faster. You know, the best thing would be to store it in a freezer, but you can't get enough freezers to store that much seed. Um, then we have seed mixing day where this may be for a seed mix for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And this may be a seed mix for Farmer Joe's um, site, you know, one may be a little wetter, so you want a little different seed mix. This may be an upland mixed grass prairie mix. Uh, this might be a tall grass mix, but you just take all those buckets and we aren't very precise. You know, I want some wild rose in this one. So you dump some wild rose in that pile and I want prairie clover and um, that's how they make their mixes. Gary, I had a quick question. All right. I, I noticed that there's a reaction tab now. So I, I was raising my hand. That's oh, what sorry. Is on there. I don't <laughs> notice those things. So just pipe in. 
Okay, yeah, no worries. I don't know how to make it go away. Okay, I can lower it. Um, so yeah, you were talking about just storage um, of the seeds. I was wondering, um, what do you do for like a cold stratification? Do you just leave them in, you know, in those buckets in a shop all winter? Or do you, what do you do about that? Well, what we do, and I'll talk about it more in a bit, but you know, this seed's harvested spring through fall. Okay. It stays in an outdoor shop and most of it's planted that winter. You know, oh. it's really good if you can get that seed out you know, you don't want to plant it too early because, well, you don't want to play it, plant it in September because it might start germinating. And so you put it out in November and hopefully it gets some snow on it. So it gets both cold and wet stratified. And um, we don't drill plant. We just drop it in the soil and hope that rain, I'll talk more about that later. But um, okay. seed mixes for various soils and wetness. Um, we've actually gone to a lower grass seeding rate that, you know, the problem with a lot of NRCS plantings, they require a lot of grass seed and they want you to drill plant it so it comes up fast. And that was all designed for erosion control. But if your grass develops too fast, it outcompetes all your wildflowers. Um, Prairie Plains only plants about one pound, maybe a little more wildflower seed, pure seed per acre, where you go back east where some group may have a lot of money, you know, they're putting up to seven pounds of seed per acre, and it makes a difference. Um, a lot of their restorations, to be honest, are smaller, where we may be doing a hundred acres and you know we can't, and the landowners can't afford to pay a thousand or twelve hundred dollars an acre just for their seed, which this may cost that much or more. So we kind of go with by what Nebraskans can afford, to be honest. And we have a lot of trouble that a lot of species like this little Missouri milk vetch that grows on dry bluffs, little pods or the prairie violet, you know, we just can't get enough seed. What we have found is that this violet is really easy to grow in greenhouses. And so we started, or Prairie Plains has started growing plugs of it and planting the plugs. And what prairie people are learning is that some of these species don't have a long seed viability, especially a lot of the spring species that it's People are starting to think you got to plant this in the spring right after you collect it, that that seed's not going to stay very viable. But the problem is, you know, we're planting into crop fields and those crop fields are in crops till the fall. So we can't plant it. If we let those fields sit idle for a summer, they'd be a field full of weeds and be really difficult to plant. Um, some groups and some people are starting to leave out the tall grasses, the big blue stem Indian grass. Just to reduce competition, they're going more with mixed grass plantings. And um, we're trying one. I, down in Nebraska City, isn't anybody familiar with Lead Lodge? Uh, we're doing a 20 acre restoration there where we're trying that and we're putting really heavy uh, wildflowers rates on uh, that group has a little bit of money and so demonstration for Nebraska. Um, you know, there's a, plant, a couple prairie plants called Canada wild rye and Virginia wild rye that come on really fast in restoration, but they don't do very well in the long term. They start to fade as the other perennials come in and they're kind of good to use as a cover crop in, on some soils like up north in clays, wet clay soils that Canada thistle will come in anywhere there's bare soil. So in those types of situations, it's good to put in a fair amount of Canada wild rye just to get something on the ground pretty fast. So our planting, um, 
pretty simple. These are old easy flow fertilizer spreaders. They're getting kind of hard to find, but you can get them at a farm auction for like a hundred bucks or 200 bucks. They have these bins and in there is an auger that would feed the fertilizer out, but it's also great for funneling seed through these little vents in the bottom that you can adjust the opening. So you set those vents and you put some pieces of paper down and drive over them and you can actually kind of calculate the seeds per square foot, which is a standard NRCS rate for seeding. So this is Mike Bullerman. So he has his easy flows all figured out how to set them, how fast to drive on the four wheeler to get that seeding rate. And we don't clean our seed because those augers will force all that rough stems, seed coats, or not seed coats, but uh, leaves that might be in the mix right through the auger. So you drive that on a four wheeler and it drops the seed out. This one, he has a little harrow to kind of cover it with a little soil dragging right behind it. And you can plant maybe 35, 45 acres a day, one person with this easy flow. There's, I don't think that's Mike, but that's his assistant filling it with seed. But, you know, mainly these restorations are in, this is an old cornfield. This looks like something else, maybe wheat. This is the edge of a wetland restoration that was put in on one of our wildlife areas. So this wetland was just restored. And this is soil that probably came out of that wetland was smoothed out. So they're doing a prairie planting next to the wetland. Um, just real quick, another kind of, this is a commercial broadcast planter. They're called Viacon seed spreaders. And it's just got this spinning set of blades. The seed drops out of there at a specific rate and that blade throws the seed out. This is a, a seed drill that um, seeds up in here and it actually makes a little furrow, drops the seed out in this row and this little compactor rolls over and presses the seed into the soil. Um, more efficient, um, a lot of CR NRCS requires CRP fields to be drill planted. Um, Seed to soil contact is, is vital in grass plantings. Um, Prairie Plains does not use a seed drill, to be honest, because their rough clean seal seed will not go through a drill. And another problem is that some prairie plants have tiny, tiny, almost microscopic seeds. And if you put those into the soil, they do not have enough energy source to get through even that quarter or top inch of soil, they need to be sitting on top of the soil to germinate. You know, big seeded legumes like Canada milk vetch or grass seed, they have enough endosperm and energy source to grow up through a half inch of soil. So you have to be really careful what you plant with these seed drills. Um, John Judson, the guy in Iowa, what he does is he likes his fields dist. He drives his tractor with the Viacon seed drill, and then he has these heavy rollers, these metal rollers, and some are filled with water. So he's dropping the seed on bare soil, but these rollers are not burying the seed, but they're pressing the seed into the soil and making a really form, uh, firm seed bed. Nobody has ever tried this in Nebraska, but um, John has showed me some of his pictures of his restorations and boy, it might be the way to go. Um, so it's not putting the seeds too deep in the soil where they can't get out. It's not leaving them just lying in the soil, but it's pressing them into the soil. Um, house grown plugs, like I said, many of the things we can't get enough seed or they just you know, a lot of these species that the soil is such a complex, I'll even call it an organism where 
a lot of these species have associations with mycorrhizae fungi. Their, their seeds have, are, their height around the seed and they feed the young plant roots and it's pretty complex. And I think some species don't come up because our soils are so poorly developed and they may not have all the microorganisms there um, or else we just can't get enough seed. So prairie plains will grow a lot of species, not a lot, but um, in their greenhouse, it's really easy to grow violets. We plant the plugs in the fall and they have a really probably 95% survival rate of violet plugs. Um, at that lead lodge planting, John Jetson is growing several thousand plants and there's a hiking trail through it and there's some places where people can sit down. So we're really beefing up these areas around these resting areas with plug planting. So these people will just be surrounded by wildflowers. A lot of the plantings John does uh, in cities He'll use plugs because they establish fast. Uh, you can get a lot of species, a lot of showy wildflowers. He actually did a roof planting in Des Moines uh, using thousands of plugs. And the whole building was designed to carry this weight of this prairie restoration. And he gave a presentation not too long ago. And it's, it's pretty cool what this rooftop looks like using these prairie plugs. Um, Seeding uh, prairie species back into established prairie. This is, my wife grew up on a farm in South Dakota and we, we manage it now. And it's got a 45 acre prairie that was really degraded. Uh, the neighbors hate it for years, uh, did a lot of herbicide spraying. We stopped the haying, started doing heavy spring grazing and burning and fall grazing to hit the smooth brome and Kentucky group bluegrass. And, and a lot of, not a lot, but a fair number of wildflowers came back on their own. But it was missing a lot of things. This is a plant that was on an, another native prairie on the farm called poison milk vetch. Um, prairie sink foil wasn't there. So I started collecting these seeds. This is a cool plant. It, there's a whole story on this plant, but those are the seed pods. It's pretty easy to get a lot of seed. I would cut this one from other prairies and just started throwing it out there by hand. But the other thing, I we did other things. You know, we some of the real bromiaries we sprayed with Roundup in the fall to kill the brome for a couple of years. We really opened it up with heavy, heavy spring and fall grazing. We did some spring burning, so we had a fair amount of openings and. When you throw the seed out, you've got to suppress those grasses to give those seedlings a chance to get established. And so we just basically grazed the snot out of it, but we didn't graze it in the summer when these seedlings were growing. We only grazed it early in the spring and in the fall. And we've got a few of these plants, uh, prairie sink foils coming up in a lot of areas. We probably have about 50 butterfly milkweed plants that have started in those 40 acres just from throwing out seed. Compass plant, huh, probably got 60 or seven compass plants in that now just from seed that I threw out. So it works, but you need some mechanism of disturbance to keep those prairie grasses short for a while. So all our prairie restorations, this was a crop field, all these ag fields are full of weed seeds from, you know, they've been using Roundup Ready crops for decades, but they're still a huge seed bank in these crop soils from years ago, I think. And you let them go idle a year and all those weeds come up. So this was planted in the winter. And this is what a typical prairie restoration looks like the next summer. Foxtails everywhere common sunflower. Um, by year two, these are all annual weeds. And most of these ag soils have an overabundance of nitrogen in them from just the fertilizers the farmers are using. So these weeds are all feeding on that nitrogen. And even by the second year, they've used a lot of it up and their growth is really reduced. 
And some of the prairie grasses are stunning. Here's all the Canada wild rye that um, fast establishing perennial grass. Uh, yellow coneflower is coming in, a short lived perennial. You still have a lot of mare's tail and annual weed. But, you know, some of the restorations first year are just all annual sunflowers. But if you were to look in here, even after year two, you see these little prairie plants starting. This looks like a native penstemon. Out in this, you'll see, if you really look, little blue stem plants this tall, real spindly. Um, maybe a Canada milk vetch that's this tall with a few leaves. So they're even starting under these weeds. And these weeds may actually provide a benefit of providing partial shade that you know, if these prairie plants are growing in full sun, it might just get too hot for them. So some restorations think you should mow the weeds down, others don't. So it's it's a little controversial. I shouldn't say controversial, but people have different ideas. But by year three or four, more prairie plants are starting to come in. You've got Canada milk vetch. You've got pitcher sage, it looked like. And your five to six, even more of the perennials, purple prairie clover, you had Illinois uh, bundle flower. So they don't establish real soon. You know, lead plant, you never see any lead plant till like the sixth year. Um, rosin weed. And to be honest, um, sometimes these plants don't, uh, if you have a series of drought years, you may have a flop. Um, some come in better on better soils. Um, hard clay seem to be somewhat hard to do a prairie restoration in. Um, silt loams may be a little easier or easier. Bill Whitney, I says, never judge a prairie planting till its fifth year. Um, management, you know, we have exotic species. This is a prairie up in Northeast Nebraska invaded by smooth brome, a, a grass from Europe, a forage grass that's just super aggressive. Got one little wildflower left out here. St. John's wort is a European plant that's been coming in in the last decade. So a lot of our management of prairie is battling these invasive species. But prairies involved with fire, they evolved with heavy bison grazing, heavy in some areas, whoops. Um, so, you know, they need to be managed. They need to be grazed at the right time. They need prescribed fire. Um, you know, how heavy you graze, how long you graze is, you know, critical. I, that's a whole nother talk, prairie management, but they need to be managed like native prairies were in the past. Um, you know, where to get local ecotype seed. And it's not needed for all plantings, but beware a pre-packaged wildflower seed mix. I've just been talking with, a, he's a landscaper from Omaha that I talked today. He got a seed mix, I won't name the dealer, but a wildflower seed mix. And he wanted me to look at it. He was gonna put in a planting and oh my God, it had European plants in it, exotic grasses in it, had some native wildflowers, but you gotta be really careful what they're selling you. Um, Eastern Nebraska, we don't have a lot of seed dealers that will sell local ecos type seed. We have a few that aren't large scale, but Iowa mandates that they use local ecotype seed in all their roadside plantings. Um, they do a lot of local ecotype NRCS planting. So they have a whole established market or dealers that sell only local ecotype seed. And it's pretty easy to get in Iowa. And we actually will use Eastern Iowa or Western Iowa seed in some of our Eastern Nebraska plantings because we'd rather use local ecotype seed from Iowa than cultivar seed. Um, so it, it's fairly easy and they have so many dealers in Iowa that the seed price is actually fairly reasonable for local ecotype seed. We do some publications. Uh, the Tallgrass Prairie Center uh, in North 
Central Iowa has a book. There's journals, ecological restoration. Um, I put out a little book when I worked for Prairie Plains called A Guide to Prairie and Wetland Restoration, Eastern Nebraska. Not a super long, but if you just Google that, there's a few sites that have it online. Um, there in that book, we provide some species lists like for tall grass prairie in Eastern Nebraska or a wet meadow planting or a mixed grass prairie planting. And basically it talks about the methods in a little more detail that I just talked about uh, just now. So that's my last slide. If there are any questions. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, have you been able to identify what plants might be missing, uh, like a mycorrhizal symbiont or some sort of microbe? Um, have you been able to notice certain species? Yeah, there's there's a plant called passflower, which is kind of a northern species, but we get it kind of in a line of counties in northeast Nebraska that, for one, it's hard to get seed. Um, two, you know, we've tried transplanting some plants and the transplants all die, um, which is strange. There was a this isn't a plant we use in prairie restorations, but a white lady slipper orchid, a very rare orchid that had microhyzal associations. And there was a, it was grown in a road ditch by Columbus and that site was gonna be developed. So we went out and dug about 20 of the plants out of the ditch, had a big clump of their soil with them. And we put some in the central Platte Valley and we put some on some WMAs in Northeast Nebraska. They lived a year and they all died. And you know, maybe we didn't get the exact hydrology it needed. Maybe the mycorrhizae couldn't survive in where we put it. It's hard to say, but um, what other things? Gentians are really hard. We cannot get gentians to start by seed, but there's a, a place in central Iowa that uh, kind of a national park that does a lot of prairie restorations and they, their gentians seem to do fine there. Um, I don't know why, um, but uh, certain things like uh, prairie turnip, um, don't see it in our restorations. I did throw some seed out in that prairie in South Dakota and I did see a plant two years ago and I think it must have come from seed that I threw out. So um, fair number of species that are somewhat hard to establish or hard to establish in prairie restorations. And a lot of times I'm not sure we know the reason, but we're drier than a lot of places. You know, you go back to Wisconsin and, and some of their restorations are just beautiful and really diverse with species that I think, oh man, I don't know if we could get, you know, they have a different species diversity in different plants, but I don't know if it's because they have more moisture um, or they put more seed on, I'm not really sure. We're out here on the drier part of the plains. This lead lodge restoration is gonna be very interesting. We use a different planting technique. We put more seed, we put seed of a lot of very conservative wildflowers in it because the Arbor Day Foundation actually owns that land and Arbor Day Foundation has some money and they were willing to go with a really high price seed mix. So that's gonna be an interesting planting. Just went in about a month ago. What's the acceptance from everybody uh, for prairie restoration? Have you, cause in your, your talk about uh, Oakland burning you said that you know acceptance was a, a crucial part of it. Is acceptance, uh, the public's acceptance of this at all a factor? Um, no, not really. The Oak Woodland thing, the acceptance, a lot of it was because it was in a state park and we were really changing things up, burning, killing shade tolerant trees. 
So the acceptance really was getting our park visitors to accept what we're doing. There is no real resistance to prairie restoration that I know of. And that's a very interesting point. You know, we were talking, well, about wetland restoration and the difficulty of some of that, because like in the sand hills, we're restoring some wetlands, but you know, some of those wetlands were ditched and they had a really, really high organic component to the soil, almost a mucky soil. And once you dry those with ditching, a lot of that organic matter breaks down and is gone. The same with prairie soils, they've been farmed and erosion has carried away all that organic rich topsoil that supports a lot of life. But oak woodlands, they've never been farmed. Their main problem is they, they haven't been burned. They get overrun with junk trees, but you can get rid of those. And that soil profile is still there. Some of the stories about native plant response and getting increased diversity, just coming back on its own, pretty incredible in oak woodlands. And I think it's all because their soils haven't been screwed with or destroyed. You know, a lot of our wetlands were farmed. Uh, Soils dried out, peat broke down, um, sediment has washed into these wetlands from farm, but oak woodlands seem to be a different story. I think it's because they got their pure soils left. Are there any fungi that you've uh, noticed popping up after a prescribed burn or? Oh, in prairies? Mm-hmm. You know that, no. Um, um, here's, I don't know mushrooms that well, but here's an interesting thing I found at that little prairie restoration aurora. There's a group of plants called, uh, the genus is Silphium, they're a type of aster. Um, one is compass plant, one is rosin weed. One is cup plant, pretty big, robust plants. And the uh, rosin weed and cup or uh, compass plant have a rosette. You know, these plantings aren't far from a forest, but morel mushrooms love growing around silphium rosettes. And the only in the rosette, they are getting something off the roots of those plants. And I've mentioned that nobody's ever, you know, you always think it's gotta be trees, but they will grow around these certain wildflowers. <clears throat> that sounds who, like, we, what's that? Sounds as though we could do a experiment of that sort. Ah. Buy some morel spawn and uh, plant it out in, where those prairie plants are? Ah, so I could buy spawn online and take it up to South Dakota and spread it around my compass plant in our pasture and I might get morel mushrooms growing up there. Right. Ooh, that's an idea I like. <laughs> I'm interested in all the rust fungi that might be there in the prairie grasses. Yeah. I was talking to uh, the wheat breeder and there's evidence that uh, one of the wheat rust went to a buckthorn, an invasive and uh, hybridized there with another species and came back with new genes. <laughs> and, really? and so these things are happening, but no one's keeping track of it. Yeah. And I can't believe there's not rusts on the prairie plants that are actually related closely to our crop rusts and might even be contributing some genes occasionally to the um, rust on wheat and other crops. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. You know, you know, just you start reading the number of insects, like I said, that are just specific to one prairie plant. They only feed on that 
or they only get nectar from that plant. You know, you've got to think there's so many fungi that are, that we probably don't even know about that are tied to these prairie plants. And yeah, we should see if there's records of uh, rust fungi on the prairie plants in our herbarium uh, in Nebraska Hall, because that is the most likely pathogenic fungus that anyone would have looked for and cataloged on prairie plants over the last hundred years. Mm. So I imagine we do have records of them. And as a club, it would kind of be nice to know what uh, we might find in the prairie before we go out to a prairie. And um, if we had a list of rust fungi known to be in Nebraska prairies, Mm. You know, we could encounter them again on a, a walk or a foray. It's just an idea that always interested me. That... Any other questions or I'll unshare my screen. All right. It's all yours. Cool. <laughs> well, everybody, now we have some hangout time. Um, I do have, uh, well, first off, Jerry, thank you so much for giving us a talk. That was really great. Enjoyed that. 